He came back just in time. We, uh, we've had some really good associate pastors here. It's always tough when the time comes to say goodbye. This is Pastor Matthew and Amy's last Sabbath with us for a while. He will come back as Dr. Prasante. <laughs> Amen. He grew up here, and uh, I think about 18 years ago when we met, you were, I can't remember how old you were, oh, don't say it, that old. He was, <laughs> uh, she was one year old when I came. That's got to be what it is. I just want these two to know how proud I am of them. And as my last sermon, uh, I really had intended to preach something that was about keeping the faith, but it seemed as if what I wanted to preach is not exactly what God had in mind, and that often happens. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them with me uh, to the book of Matthew, chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, and beginning in verse 20. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 20. And we're just going to look at four verses of Scripture today. So you can keep your Bibles open if you have them to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20. And uh, let's look at it together. The Bible reads in verse 20, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, that's Jesus, with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And Jesus said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, 
one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to Jesus, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. We'll take a pause right there. My sermon uh, for the last time this morning is entitled The Wrong Kind of Prayer. The Wrong Kind of Prayer. I don't know about you, but have you ever prayed something ridiculous that didn't really make a lot of sense? I know I'm guilty of that on some occasions. I'm out to eat with my family members. I'm out to eat with my friends. My mind isn't in a very spiritual place at the moment. And uh, all of a sudden, it's time to pray for the food. And they say, hey, pastor, can you pray for us? And I'm kind of like, oh, okay, sure. So we bow our heads to pray, but I'm unprepared. I'm not in the right mind. And I begin to pray something that doesn't make any sense. Father in heaven, thank you for the loving weather and the gracious sky. Amen. And it's like, what? That doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, oh, I mean, thank you for the food. Amen. Uh, Have you ever prayed something ridiculous that just doesn't make sense, that the words just don't come together the right way uh, in a very important time? I know sometimes I'm out visiting, and very seldom, but it happens, uh, I'm visiting with someone who's going through something so serious. And I'm there to pray for them about their issue, you know, and, about, and for them that, that their life would be better, that God would bless their life. And we get down, we kneel, sometimes even hold hands, and we begin to pray. And the words that come out of my mouth, I don't even know if they're English sometimes. It just seems like the words that I'm saying, they don't make any sense. Sometimes we pray ridiculous things. Sometimes we pray things that don't really make a whole lot of sense. And I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit this morning because even when we pray prayers like that, I believe God is able to understand our hearts despite our lack of uh, eloquence with words. Amen? Sometimes we might not say the right words, we might say the wrong words, but God still hears our prayers and answers them anyway. So there is what I would call a wrong kind of prayer. But that's not the kind of prayer I'm talking about. The wrong prayer I'm talking about is found in our passage this morning. Look with me again at verse 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, came to Jesus with her sons kneeling down and asking something from him. And Jesus said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Take a pause right there. You see, without the context of this story, this request, this prayer doesn't seem too bad. I mean, it looks rather good. Jesus is there. James, John, their mother Salome are there, and they come to Jesus with a request. They come to Jesus as a family. They pray to God. They lift their prayer request to God as a family. And that's a good thing, isn't it? Praying with your family, it's a great thing. And they ask Jesus a request, a prayer request. You might say, Matthew, that's not a prayer request. Well, look at the Bible. It says they come to Jesus and they are, are they standing? No, they're kneeling. The Bible says they come to Jesus and they're kneeling. And they come to Jesus asking him for something. That sounds a lot like a prayer request to me. Uh, I bet it does to you as well. And they ask Jesus for something special. Uh, They ask Jesus for positions in the kingdom of heaven. 
And even that, at first glance, doesn't seem to be uh, messed up. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that prayer request. I mean, what is wrong with having a parent pray for their children to be in the kingdom of heaven? Is there anything wrong with that? Of course not. They're not asking that, though. Because there's nothing wrong with asking for your children to be in the kingdom of heaven. No, they're asking for something specific. James, John, their mother Salome, they come asking for something very particular. They ask for a position that is high. They ask for a promotion. They ask Jesus to give them places in his kingdom that are more prestigious than the other ten disciples. They ask for positions of power to wield authority over their colleagues. Have you ever prayed a prayer asking God for a blessing and not receiving the answer of yes to that blessing, to that prayer request? Not until later, not until realizing later that if God were to answer your prayer request yes, then that blessing to you would be a curse to somebody else. The Zebedee family, they have their own little prayer meeting. They have their own little powwow prayer time. And they get to the foot of Jesus and they ask something that is very twisted. They ask Jesus for something uh, uh, very selfish. And if you were to see the scene of James and John and their mother Salome come to Jesus, praying at his feet, you might be fooled into thinking they're on the right track. You might be thinking that, you know what, they're asking Jesus for something, they're praying, they're on the right track. But they came to Jesus asking for positions, uh, high positions, because they believed that like Caesar, Jesus would reign on earth and he would have omnipotent power on earth. And they weren't asking just for positions in heaven to be saved. No, they were asking for positions of authority, to be second in command, one on his right hand, one on his left hand. And it must have taken a lot of courage for them to ask such a serious uh, favor from God. They weren't asking for something small. They were asking for something very big from God. And it must have taken them a lot of courage. And so that's why they probably uh, brought their mommy. Because maybe mommy can help them as they're uh, needing something. You see, I worked at primary division over the last three years, and in primary division, uh, they've developed a system, a monetary system there known as primary pennies. I don't know if we have any of the kids here. Do any of the kids here know what the primary pennies are? Yeah, I have just a couple of them. Primary pennies, they earn you prizes. So if you come to class, if you bring your Bible, you'll get a primary penny. You bring your Bible, you get a primary penny. And with that primary penny, you can win some prizes. Uh, If you memorize your Bible text, for God so loved the world, like if you memorize your Bible text, uh, then you'd get three primary pennies. Uh, If you were a good boy and a good girl and you sat down in class and you behaved and you were friendly to everyone, every once in a while you would get five primary pennies uh, for being a good young boy and young girl to, to listen in class. We wanted an incentive so that they would learn more in in primary class. And this caused us so much problems. You would have no idea how much problems primary, uh, primary pennies would cause. Because the kids stopped focusing on anything you were talking about, and their eyes were focused on those pennies. And all they were were little buttons we bought at Walmart. But they wanted those pennies so bad. And so sometimes when you wouldn't look at the kid when they'd be out on a recess or or whatnot, you would look back and you'd see some of the children scavenging around the other children's primary pennies. And they'd be taking their primary pennies when no one was watching. So really, you see the, the... the base of humanity at the primary level age. Uh, And sometimes it got so bad that some of the kids, they would actually gather up in little gangs. They would bully other people. Be like, hey, what you got there? See, you got some pennies there. They would turn mafia on other primary kids and try to take their primary pennies. 
because primary pennies meant prizes, and they wanted those prizes. They wanted it badly. There were some kids who I would consider to be the smartest of the children. They knew something that the other kids had not really realized. Uh, there were some children who had parents. Well, they all had parents, but there were some children who had parents who had the kind of parent who believe every single word that their little child said. And they learned that if mommy and daddy come to Pastor Matt, then their chances of getting a primary penny increase. I didn't bring my Bible today, but I brought my mommy and daddy. I didn't memorize my Bible text, but I brought my mommy and daddy. And they learned that if they brought their mommy and daddy, their odds of getting primary pennies increased. And so it's funny because you have you know, grown adults advocating vehemently for their children to get this primary penny. <laughs> because they know if mommy and daddy come, the odds of them getting that penny increase. James and John, they bring their mommy. They bring their mommy to Jesus and they say, Lord, give us a primary penny. Give us the positions we want it so badly. And the mother says, yes, yes, give them positions. And church, here's the lesson for us today. Regardless of who you get to pray for you, there are some prayer requests that are so wrong, that are so twisted, that regardless who you get to pray for you, God will never agree to. There are some uh, requests that even if you come to prayer meeting and you get a band of righteous warriors praying for you, there are some requ requests that are so twisted that God will never agree to them. You can go and you can rally every pastor on the face of the planet to pray for you, but there are some requests that God will just simply deny and sometimes when we pray the wrong kind of prayer, and by the wrong kind of prayer I mean selfish prayers that just speak of our self-exaltation, uh, self sometimes in life we get the answer yes to the prayers we ask. The selfish prayers we ask that are all about us, that demean others, we get the answer yes and we think God has answered our prayers, but I want you to beware that if God or if the answer to your selfish prayer is a yes, beware, because that answer could come from the devil himself. James and John, they bring their mommy to Jesus because they think the odds are better that if she comes, they'll get the position they want. And when you study the passage a little more uh, in, in depth, you find that... Uh, James and John had a different self-entitlement issue. You see, other times when you and I, we work for God, or when you and I, we are faithful to God, we might trick ourselves into thinking that God owes us something. That because I've been faithful to God, God now has to be faithful to me in the precise way that I want. You know, many theologians, including Mrs. White, teach that James and John... Their mother, Salome, was the woman who financially supported Jesus' ministry for three and a half years. She was one of the women who financially supported Jesus. She gave him money. So now it was time for her to have the favor returned. Jesus, I scratched your back, and now it's time for you to scratch mine. But church, I need you to know something, that your actions never merit what God will give you. Grace is a gift. You don't earn it. You can, never pray, you can never pay God off. He doesn't take bribes. There are some prayer requests that God will not agree to, regardless if you pay your tithe or not. There are some prayer requ requests that are so wrong that even if you put a few extra dollars in the offering plate, God won't answer those prayers uh, because selfish prayers, selfish ex exaltation of prayers, those kinds of prayers are the wrong kinds of prayers. And if you think that prayers of self selfish exaltation 
are answered yes by God, you need to beware because that answer yes could be coming from the devil himself. Friends, let's look at how Jesus actually answers selfish prayers. Look at verse 22. Jesus answered. Jesus answered. Even when you don't get what you want, Jesus still answers. Even though times happen and the prayer you lift before God, the result that comes is not what you wanted, Jesus answers. And he said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? You can take a pause right there. Even though the Zebedees had the wrong prayer request, Jesus continued the conversation. Listen carefully. It is better to pray a selfish prayer than not pray at all. It is better to pray a selfish, the wrong kind of prayer than not pray at all. Because when you open that door of communication, when you begin that dialogue between you and Christ, he has the power to transform your selfish prayer request as he transforms you into a selfless person. Are you praying the wrong kind of prayer this morning? Are your prayer requests just about you? Don't, if so, don't stop praying. Jesus will still work good in your life. He will still answer your prayer even if the answer is not what you want. There is a power in prayer that goes beyond getting what you want. James and John, they pray the wrong prayer. Uh, They want to be exalted. They want to have a position on the top of the corporate ladder. But carefully notice what Jesus says and what position the two brothers agree to. Look again at verse 22, continuing to verse 23. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father." Often, people come to Jesus and they're prescribing to Him what they want Him to do, but leave subscribing to what He wants them to do for Him. When you pray, when your prayer changes to what, when your prayer changes from prescription, telling God what you want Him to do, to subscription, from what God telling you what He wants you to do, then you're on the right track. This is exactly what happened to James and John. They came to Jesus and they prescribed to be promoted, but upon talking to Jesus, they subscribed to be demoted. They came talking on what they wanted, but Jesus flipped it right back on them and they left listening and obeying and agreeing to what Jesus wanted them to do. You see, some of you are under the impression that prayer is like a vending machine. That if you were to press the right buttons at just the right times, if you're to live the right life in just the right way, and you lift your prayer request before God, He will answer your request the way you want. That's what you hear on TV. Pray to God and He'll send the blessings down on you. We think that God is a genie that if we rub the lamp the right way, we'll get what we want. But prayer, listen carefully, is firstly about submitting to God what He wants from you. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, we hear God telling us, Thy Father, uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be Thy name, Thy kingdom come. What's the next part? 
Thy will, thy will be done. Before requests are made, we submit ourselves to God's will. And that's why Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed three times in deep prayer, not what I want, Lord. Not what I want, Lord, but what you want, Lord. What you want. You see, as you continue to pray, Even if it's the wrong kind of prayer, God works mightily in your life. Because as you pray a wrong prayer that is full of selfish exaltation, as you continue to pray, as you continue to pray, you'll start to see a change. You'll start to realize the power of prayer. If you find yourself praying the wrong kind of prayer, a prayer that's just about you, that's just about yourself, I will encourage you to keep praying. Pray. 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 And soon you will see the real power in prayer is its power to change you. As you continue to pray, God will work mightily in your life. Because listen carefully, God is more interested in your character and less about your circumstance. We pray for our circumstance when God is interested in our character, when God wants to work on our character. So you pray for that job and you say, Lord, give me that job. And then God doesn't give you that job and you say, God doesn't answer prayers. God did answer your prayers. He just didn't answer it the way you wanted because God is more interested in your character and less interested in your circumstance. You prayed for good health. Lord, keep me healthy. I've got a trip coming up. And you get sick. And you think, ah, God, you don't love me. You don't care for me. Because if you did, I wouldn't have gotten sick. You would have answered my prayer request. But God did answer your prayer request. Because he cares more about your character and less about your circumstance. You pray for a relationship. You say, Lord, I'm single. Why haven't you brought someone in my life? Lord, why uh, why is everything going wrong? Why don't you give me what I want? And Jesus replies, no. And you think he's not answering you at all. But God cares more about your character and less about your circumstance. You might have a business that you've started and you said, Lord, I want to do good in this business. I want it to thrive. I want this business to be great. Lord, I give it to you. Help it to be something good. And your business fails. And you say, Lord, why aren't you answering my prayer request? He did. Because God cares more about your character and less about your circumstances. So sometimes, no, not all the time, God permits disasters in answer to your prayer because God cares more about you than about what you get. And God knows that if these good things were to happen to you, it would corrupt your character. And God wants your character. He wants you more than he wants the good things in your circumstance. You see, James and John, they agreed to drink the cup that Christ drank. They agreed to be baptized like Christ was baptized. And that simply means they agreed to experience what Christ had experienced. The triumph and the misery. The joy and the agony. And Jesus assured them a future like his. He says, you will indeed drink this cup. You will indeed uh, be baptized with my baptism. But before Jesus was accepted, friends, he was rejected. Before Jesus was glorified, he was crucified. His agony preceded his joy. His misery came before his triumph. And when you align yourself to walk with God, which is what prayer really does, you need to recognize that before you will be glorified, you will be crucified. Before you have triumph, there will be misery. That was the path of Jesus, and we are no better than him. That's the path we accept when we pray for God's will to be done. And if you were to examine the life of James and John, they indeed indeed did drink Christ's cup, 
and they were baptized with his baptism. If you look at the records of their life, James, according to the book of Acts, he was put to death by the sword, the first apostle to be put to death, not many years after the death of Christ, because it made the people happy. So he started killing off Jesus' disciples. John, the other little brother, he lived the longest. And you'd say, man, God blessed him the most. No, Uh, John, he got to see the deformation of the church. He got to see the church rise. He got to see his friends in positions in the church. He saw the gospel spread to the entire world. And then one by one, he saw it taken away from them. He saw his friends murdered. He saw people take their place in positions that they didn't care about the people of God. They just cared about themselves. He went through intense persecution his entire life. And if you were to look at their lives from a worldly perspective, you'd say, hey, God doesn't answer your prayers because look how bad their life was. But God cared more about their character and less about them, their circumstance. And friends, for you today, God might not give you everything that you want, but I guarantee you he will give you everything you need. Not in order for you to be happy, no, but in order to save you. There is a a story of a young man who grew up with his rich and wealthy parents in a white-collar home. He was a single, uh, not a single, but he was an only child. And so as an only child, having two rich and wealthy parents, his parents gave him everything that he wanted as a little boy. He'd go out to the mall and he'd see ice cream in the ice cream shop, and he'd say, Mommy, Daddy, can I have some ice cream? And they'd give him some ice cream. And then he'd say, no, mommy, daddy, I don't want vanilla, I want chocolate. And he'd throw it away and his mom and dad would get him chocolate. Uh, As the boy continued growing older, this kind of thing kept happening. He grew older and he started to like hockey and he said, dad, father, I've got this hockey stick that I want to buy. It's only $300, but it's signed by Wayne Gretzky. It's his kind of hockey stick. So if you gave me this kind of hockey stick, I'd be a better hockey player. And his father and mother loved him. They wanted the best for him, so they gave him a hockey stick. This kind of thing continued to happen. He grew older. He went to college. He uh, went to school, and he said, hey, dad, can you give me uh, a new car? I want to be able to go out with my friends. Hey, Dad, can you buy me a new car? When I ask a girl on a date, I can only walk her to the cafeteria. It's embarrassing. Please, give me a new car. And his father said, okay, I love you. I'm going to give you this new car. And this kind of thing kept happening. The child kept on getting what he wanted. He kept on getting what he wanted, and everything seemed fine. He graduated, he got a good job, he purchased a house, he put a down payment on a house, and everything seemed fine. But there was a problem with that young man because he was so used to getting what he wanted. He was so used to everything that he saw and wanted, he got because his daddy would give it to him. And so as an adult, he went to the mall and he saw, hey, new shoes. He had a closet full of them, but he said, hey, new shoes. And he swiped his credit card and he got some new shoes. He went to Best Buy and he's like, whoa, there's a high-definition TV. It's huge. 1080p, it's a wonderful television. And he wanted it. He didn't have the money, but he swiped his credit card and he got it. He went to the brick and he said, you know what, I'm sick of the Kijiji furniture I grew up with at college. I'm going to get some nice furniture. He couldn't afford it, but he swiped his card and he got a brand new furniture set. And then lo and behold, the, the, the time came when he couldn't pay his bills. And he got a phone call from his mortgage company saying, hey, if you don't pay your bill, I'm gonna ha- we're going to have to seize your home. And so the man, the, the young man was worried. He's like, what am I going to do? What's going to happen? I need help. And then he remembered, my dad, he always helps me. He always gives me what I want. And so he called his dad and he said, Dad, hey, I got these new kicks. You would like them. I got this new TV that's beautiful. You'd like it. Dad, I got this new sofa. If when you sit on it, it feels like it's a wonderful cloud that you're sitting on. He said, Dad, can you pay for my mortgage though? I overspent and I need the money. And his dad looked at him. 
And he said, son, I love you. And so for this one time, I'm going to pay off your mortgage. Not completely, I, I'm mistaken the words, but I'm going to pay your, your bills so you can keep your house. And the young man was so grateful. He said, Dad, I love you. Thank you for taking care of me all my life. And, but his father said, Son, I don't want you to do that again. You need to learn to keep your finances clean. But see, there was still a problem with that young man. And just a few months went by and he was at the mall and he saw an even newer pair of shoes and he got it. He swiped his credit card. He went to Best Buy again and he saw that the 1080p uh, TV wasn't good enough. They now had 4K television and it actually bent a little bit. It actually curved a little bit. So he said, I got to get that. And he swiped his credit card and he got the TV He saw a new set of furniture at Lazy Boy, and if he got that furniture at Lazy Boy, uh, they'd give him half off on his bedroom set. So he purchased the bedroom set. He got the Lazy Boy, and he was like, man, this is awesome. He saw the lights in his house were a little outdated. He bought new fixtures, and he said, said, whoa, man, now my house is what I want it to be. He got everything he wanted. But then once again, the time came, and he got a phone call from his bank. You haven't paid your mortgage. And the young man didn't know what to do. He tried to sell some of his things to collect the money, but he couldn't gather enough money. And eventually he saw a nice piece of paper on his door that said foreclosure. He said, what am I going to do? What can I do? What is, how can I get myself out of this problem? And so he said, you know what? I have a rich dad. He's helped me before. He has the capability to get me out of this circumstance that I put myself in. And so he called up his dad and he said, Dad, hey, it's me. Um, I bought some new kicks. I bought some new shoes. I bought a new TV. I got a new bedroom set. It's wonderful. You'd like it. But Dad, there's a problem. I can't pay off my mortgage. And the dad said, Son, what do you want me to do? And the son said, Dad, I need you to pay off my mortgage one more time so I can keep my, my house. And his dad, on the phone, you could just hear silence. There was nothing. And then the father spoke. He said, Son, I love you, but I'm not going to give you what you're asking. Son, I love you, but I'm not going to give you the money that you're asking. And the son, he got so angry at his dad. He said, Dad, don't you love me? You have the ability to take care of me. Why won't you pay off my mortgage? You're rich. You could do it. And his dad said, Son, I know I have the money, but I want to help you. And you might not understand it now, but I'm not going to pay off your home. And it might hurt. And his son said, Dad, you're selfish. You never give me what I want. You don't love me because if you did, you'd answer the prayer request. You'd answer my request. And the dad responded, Son, I love you and it will hurt you for now. But I promise you, it will save you in the long run. And he hung up the phone. And that son, he hated his father. He thought his father had abandoned him. And it wasn't until he got his life on track that he realized, wait a second, my dad does love me. He does care about me. Because he didn't give me what I wanted, but he gave me what I needed. And dear church, today, when you pray to God, I need you to know that he loves you so much and that even though you might not get what you want, God cares more about who you are than your circumstance, that he will give you what you need in order to save you, in order to save your children, in order to save your family. And it might hurt for now, but in the long run, it's going to save your life. God bless you.